Hi everybody, it's Marla from Dog Care On Air and I'm here with Lola Michelin and she's here to talk to us about um, dog therapy. The title of this presentation is Tales from My Dog's Therapist. Learn the benefits of bodywork for animals from Lola Michelin, who's done massage and bodywork for animals ranging from lions to giraffes. You'll learn about massage, acupressure, aromatherapy, and kinesiology taping for animals. You'll discover some basic elements of each to use on your own canine companion, and you'll hear stories of dogs and how they benefited to, um, from loving hands. Find out how to select the right therapist for your pet's needs and discover why the emerging field of animal therapy offers a great career option for those with a passion for animals. I want to welcome our speaker, Lola Michelin. Lola has been practicing massage for over 30 years, and she founded the Northwest School of Animal Massage in 2001. She's a recognized authority on the topic and appears on radio and television stations nationwide. In addition to the school, she runs a private massage practice serving horses, dogs, people, and exotic species such as elephants, giraffes, and primates. When she isn't teaching or providing massage, she can most likely be found playing with her two Jack Russell Terriers, Stella and Izzy, riding her horse also, or chasing and being chased by her miniature donkey, Seth. <laughs> Lola! <laughs> Imagine being chased by a, your little donkey. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Marla. I'm so happy to be here with you today. And, and yes, my donkey is quite good at tracking us down. <laughs> Sometimes looking for treats, other times just bossing us around. <laughs> so you have a you have a donkey on. I, I mean, you have a piece, you live on a piece of land where you can have all these animals living with you. And I do. we have a twelve acre campus on Vashon Island in Washington. It's where we teach our classes. So it's our primary campus, in addition to some other um, satellite locations. And um, we primarily are a retirement facility for horses, um, and then we have dogs, of course, um, in the area. And so Seth uh, was originally a um, shepherd for my small goat herd that I had at the time. And now he's basically a babysitter for our older horses. So sometimes we'll have a horse there currently. Uh, for example, we have a 32-year-old thoroughbred who can't you know, be out with other horses because he's pretty frail, but he likes a buddy. So he gets the miniature donkey as a buddy. <laughs> oh, sounds like fun. Probably never a dull moment. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get into talking about massage and the different kinds of therapies available for dogs. Um, Excellent. And one question I guess that's burning in people's minds is, do dogs really need massage? <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Do they need it to survive? No. But does it help them thrive? Absolutely, yes. Yes, it does. So dogs get many of the same benefits from massage that you or I would get from a massage. Uh, a lot of times it's helpful with our geriatric pets. It can help with their mobility and pain relief, um, just keep them mentally stimulated. Um, it's also really good for, for dogs that need it for um, anxiety or a fearful dog will benefit from a massage. Uh, might be a dog who's just getting used to a new environment or home. So there's probably as many reasons for a dog to get a massage as there are for people to get a massage. I really like that answer. <laughs> um, so how do I know if my pet needs a massage? Um, well, um, it can be tricky. They're not going to tell us when they need a massage, right? We can call and schedule an appointment for a massage for ourselves, but we have to watch to see um, signs that might indicate that our, our pet would benefit from a massage. So things like if you notice that your dog is slowing down or maybe they're just not engaging in some of their usual activities, it could be time to consider a massage. Um, maybe it's part of a new activity. If you're increasing your dog's training or their exercise level, I would recommend getting a massage prior to starting any new kind of program with your dog. Um, again, if it's going to be in a new environment, maybe you've just rescued a pet and brought it home to your home. It's happy to be home. It's happy to be adopted, but it is adjusting to a new environment. So a massage can be helpful during those times. I always suggest people consider a massage before any traveling or before, for instance, a medical procedure. Maybe your dog's getting dental work done or even vaccinations. Massage beforehand could be really helpful. Um, maybe it's something 
because their routine is gonna be interrupted. If you're having people come to work in your home or maybe you're having visitors, that can upset your dog's routine. So a massage, especially a regular massage, will give your dog kind of the confidence and um, ability to tackle those challenges that life throws their way once in a while. Um, if you work with a therapist routinely, you will start to recognize and they will help you learn to recognize patterns of your dog's energy levels and their muscle tension so that you're better equipped to then decide when a massage might be appropriate. That sounds good. And so you've massaged quite um, a variety of animals. Could you talk to us about the kinds of animals you've massaged with and your experience? Yeah, you bet. Um, well, so I do love the work that I do with dogs, but I'm fortunate to work with a wide range of species. And the majority of my practice is actually horse related. So I, do, I work with a lot of horses, lots of different kinds of horses, um, but also dogs and cats and a fair amount of zoo work. Um, I've been able to work with primates, uh, giraffe, as you mentioned, and many types of birds and other types of livestock. I even worked on a rhinoceros once, which was really interesting. Uh, some of the more unusual sessions though, I think are when I've had a chance to work with wildlife. Um, there's been occasions when I've actually, you know, just being out in nature, been invited or had an opportunity to work with animals who have not even had human contact, uh, such as some marine mammals, um, deer, birds. Uh, that's, that's been really powerful. So far, I haven't met an animal, in fact, that I didn't want to massage. And the ones that I do massage, uh, I always see them get some benefit from it. Yeah, that was, that was a curiosity of mine. Are, <laughs> is it a, just a natural thing, a natural inclination for animals to just want to be touched and to be massaged? You know, touch is one of the basic survival um, things that we need for survival. It's just like food and shelter and safety. Touch is essential to life. And touch is one of the first things that animals recognize. You know, when a puppy is born, it can't see, it can't hear, it can't smell, um, but it knows touch. So it, you know, finds its mother, it, it finds nourishment through touch. So touch is one of the first things our body recognizes and hopefully one of the last things that, that we um, experience. Mm, that's nice. And there are different kinds of massage. There's massage, there's acupressure. Um, so do massage, therap do massage therapists who work on animals, especially um, for dogs, um, do they use different types of massage like acupressure? And Absolutely. Um, when we talk about massage, or sometimes people refer to it as body work, mm -hmm. we're talking about any sort of um, manipulation of the soft tissues of the body, muscles, tendons, ligaments, connective tissue. Um, using the hands or other instruments. So um, it's different than physical therapy, and it is different than acupressure, but it's very similar. And massage and acupressure are a really nice combination. A lot of people who practice massage on animals also incorporate acupressure. So the biggest difference between massage and acupressure is that acupressure is also hands-on, but it's based on traditional Chinese medicine. So in Chinese medicine, the belief is that there are channels or what they call meridians in the body that carry the energy, what they call qi or life force that animates our physical body. So massage often addresses the physical issue, the muscles and the soft tissues. Acupressure often helps to address the energy that it, the body is providing those tissues. Um, so pressure with the fingers or tools can be used on specific stations or stops on these channels that um, affect different systems of the body. So together they can really help support the animal internal external environment, mental, physical, and emotional well-being. Is are, are the acupressure points similar on the dog as they are on humans? Um, they are. There are some differences because the animal's anatomy is different. Um, there are some points that are different location, but the meridians in terms of their um, functions are often the same. So for instance, there's um, a liver meridian, which not only helps to govern the functions of the body associated with the um, liver, but also emotional aspects. Um, so we do a lot of work on uh, those points. Some maps of acupressure points 
for dogs are what we call transpositional maps, where we've taken the human points and transferred them onto the human anatomy. But we also have um, charts from China that were used, um, for instance, to provide acupressure or acupuncture for horses when they would prepare the horses for war or for battle, they would do acupuncture treatments on them. So those maps are, are somewhat different um, because horses have hoofs, we have hands. So points that are on the fingers might be the same on the dog for the paws, but might be different on the hoof of the horse. That's so interesting. And um, can pet owners learn how to massage their own pets? Like, or do we have to go through an extensive training? Absolutely. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. You know, there's all different levels of massage. As a matter of fact, if you're petting your pet, you're already doing some level of massage. So um, I often compare massage to the way we care for our teeth, right? Like we're responsible for brushing and flossing every day. Um, but every once in a while, you want to see somebody who's a professional with more training so they can do an in-depth cleaning or they can see if there's any problems starting. And then, of course, if there is a problem, you're going to go to your dentist. So animal massage is similar in that we strongly encourage owners to massage and pet their pets every day. But you also want to work with a professional who can do a more thorough job but also can tell you if there's an issue or something that needs to be addressed before it's a big problem. Because you know, early detection is the key. If we know a problem is starting, we have a lot more options in how to care for it and manage it. Um, but of course, once there's a problem, we also need to have our vet involved and, and see our vet. So we work very closely with the whole team, but everybody has their, their own role in that. Um, we offer courses uh, for pet owners because there is a level of training that I think is uh, really helpful. It empowers owners to have tools that help them manage pain for their animal or you know, manage fear or anxiety or help manage um, mobility. So anybody can learn basic skills. And we have um, like a free introductory class on our, our website, but we also have one and two day workshops where we work with pet owners. Uh, we do that a lot at shelters um, where we teach staff and volunteers to do basic massage. And then a lot of times people take the basic course and then they want to know more. So then they go on and take our um, professional certification courses as well in many cases. Um, and for many people, it started as many of our students say, well, my dog was getting older. I wanted something that would help. And so I took your class, but then I wanted to do that for a career. So then they go on to, to do that. That's great. So somebody that takes the massage course doesn't have to be a massage therapist to begin with. No, not at all. Um, there's different levels of training, as I said, but also um, every state has its own requirements for people who want to practice professionally. So some states do require licensure. Um, I don't think any states right now require that you are a human massage practitioner first but that has been the case in the past. Uh, so it's good for people to kind of look into what the rules are in their state if they're considering it as a career. Um, but anybody with an interest in animals can learn and, and there's a pathway for them to practice. So what is uh, a day in the life of a animal therapist look like? <laughs> oh, actually, no, before we go there, why don't we, why don't we look at some techniques? Um, that we have a video that you'd like to share with us. Why don't we go there? Moving into the body of the massage, you may want to start around the head or neck. With some animals, this will be an area where they feel restricted and you may want to choose to work farther back on the body to begin. This is an example of petrissage or the kneading strokes. This is very useful in the area of the neck and shoulders and involves lifting the tissues and squeezing the tissues in order to move blood and fluid in and out of the muscle and to lengthen the muscle fibers. Petrissage can be done with both hands simultaneously as shown here. It can also be done with one hand Because many dogs wear collars, 
the majority of the time. Spending time near the base of the neck and along the neck to loosen those muscles and lengthen the muscles is a great idea. So I so want to be that dog in the video. <laughs> is that, yeah. This is typical of, um, of what a dog receives in most it's, therapy sessions. Yeah, that's definitely a face I see a lot. Uh, happy face. Uh, maybe not the first time they get a massage or maybe not in the first few minutes. But animals very, very quickly realize the intent of the massage and they just, you know, give in to the comfort of it. So, yeah, we get a lot of yawning and licking and, and rolling over and all those wonderful things. It looked like the golden retrieval, retriever especially just <laughs> kind of melted into yeah. the table. <laughs> Yeah, that was Dylan, and he was truly a, a, he loved massage because he was such an active dog, big dog, really muscular. He got a lot of benefit from his, his massages, and, and he was a wonderful um, teacher to many of our students in class as well over the years. How nice. I'm sure he had a hard job. <laughs> Um, so tell us about what a typical day is like for an animal massage practitioner. Oh, sure. Well, I, I guess I would start by saying um, there's not much of a typical day. Uh, that's one of the things I love about my career is that every day is different, a different group of animals, different types of animals. Um, sometimes I'm inside um, at um, a place where people are bringing their animals to me. Sometimes I'm going out to people's homes or people's farms, and so I'm getting to go out and see a lot of different places. Um, but every day starts for me with uh, some stretching and meditation. Because my hands and my heart are my primary tools in my work, I need to make sure that at the beginning of my day, I'm taking time to be present and show up you know, as best as I can. So I wanna make sure that my, my physical self, my, my emotional self, my spiritual self are all um, ready to go. Um, and then typically I'll probably do five to eight animals in any given day. And my sessions will last between an hour to two hours, depending on the animal and the environment. Um, and a session would be, you know, when I uh, arrive at the person's home or at the barn, or if they are coming to me, we're going to do some health intake, find out what the animal has been up to, whether or not the owner has specific concerns. And then I'll do my assessments and my observations before making some goals and, and making a plan for the massage. So whether it's a geriatric massage one day, or it might be um, a horse who's getting ready for a show, or it might be a dog who's a working dog, uh, it might be an animal who's doing service work and now they're getting a break or some rest, the goals for those animals are all gonna be different. So uh, a lot of my day is spent just observing and then making decisions about how do I best serve this animal today so that each massage is completely unique to the day, the animal, and the moment. Um, and then, uh, yeah, my days can be everything from, uh, you know, working in, in the zoo and having to, getting to work with the zookeepers and um, the animals in different environments. Sometimes it's working in a household where I get to meet, you know, the whole family and interact with the dogs and other animals that might be living in the home. And sometimes I'm at an event like a dog show or a horse show where there's a lot going on. So uh, as I said, there's no typical day, um, but they're all, they're all exciting. And um, I always wake up ready to, to go out and tackle the day for sure. No, no driving through commuter traffic and sitting at a desk for me. <laughs> oh, how nice. That's a dream. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you have massaged several different types of animals you were talking about earlier. What is the most interesting animal you have dealt with? Oh, wow, so hard to pick just one. Um, I guess the ones that come to mind for me, maybe I'll just let you pick 
uh, from among them. Um, I had a really interesting um, time working with a howler monkey, um, a type of primate. I also have worked with uh, lemur and cotamundi uh, that were pretty interesting. And, um, and then of course, many of my dog cases are fascinating, even though the dogs might be a more common animal for me to work with. Some of the cases have been really unique. So, so I don't know, you pick. Why don't, why don't you tell us about the lemur? The, the lemur. lemur. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, I've worked with a number of small pr primates like this, lemurs, um, also some marsupials like Cotamundi. Now in this case, these uh, a lot of these smaller primates are um, very social animals. They live in groups. And, um, and so group dynamics are really important. They do a lot of social grooming where they massage each other. And in the case of some animals like lemurs, they even feed each other as part of their normal social activity. So the, not this particular lemur, but uh, a relative of this animal uh, was born with a really horrible skin condition. And so he didn't have any hair. Uh, you can see the beautiful coat on this animal. This, an this other animal was completely bare. Um, very rough kind of growths all over its skin, and it was constantly itchy because of it. So the vet uh, team was doing everything they could to manage the condition. But what was unfortunate was he wasn't involved in any of the social activities that his troop was involved in. And his sister would often bring him food or sneak him food, but the troop would not eat with him or feed him or groom him. So he was getting very depressed and very sick very quickly. Um, so we tried uh, massage with him and he loved it, of course, but what we, myself and the keepers were talking about was how do we get his troop mates to be interested in him so that they'll feed him and they'll um, groom him. And what we ended up doing was we took small toothbrushes and we dipped them in essential oils, ones that were safe for use on the skin, and fruit juices. And then we massaged him with the toothbrushes. And so the keepers could do it too. It didn't require me being there, but um, we came up with a little massage routine for him that would benefit his skin and his immune system. But we did it with these toothbrushes. And the odors from the fruit juices and the essential oils were so interesting to the other uh, animals that they came over and started to groom him and work with him and accept him back into the society. So it not only meant that he physically improved, but emotionally and mentally, he got a lot of benefit out of it as well. So that was a really good lesson for me as well. Yeah, I guess there's a lot of trial and there's some trial, some trial and error with, with animals and knowing what will work and what won't. Yeah, you have as many tools as you can in your toolbox, different massage techniques, different strokes, different um, other therapies that you provide like acupressure or Reiki energy work. And then, you know, it is trial and error. You try to pick the best one based on your knowledge of the anatomy and the animal and the behavior, and also based on knowing what strokes produce what results. And then sometimes you start with one, but then you switch to something that's going to work better. And the animal is the one oftentimes to give us the feedback that helps us make those decisions. Could you share a story about your own experience with, with a dog? An interesting experience? Oh, sure, sure. I'm sure you have so many. Yeah, so this, this is actually a good example of that, that same idea of like we had to try and think about how do we get this work done? Because one time I was flying home from teaching a class in Pennsylvania and I got to the airport early, early in the morning. So, um, uh, I was waiting for the, the ticketing desk to open up and a gentleman came in. He was in military uniform and he had a kennel on a cart with him. So I went over and introduced myself when we got talking and the dog that he was transporting had been his partner in the field on three different tours of duty. Um, it was a, a bomb detecting dog. And so they had worked together. Uh, they trained together here in the U.S. and then they went overseas uh, to the Middle East on several different um, uh, tours of duty together. Well, he was bringing the dog home because she had finally kind of stopped wanting to be in the field. As he said it, she, you know, one day just went out on their work in the field to try to find bombs. She just laid down and said, you know, he knew she was done. So uh, I was really impressed that he requested that she be brought back and the military brought her back immediately so that she could recover. 
So I asked him, I said, do you think she would benefit from a massage? And he got really excited about it. But of course he said, well, the only problem is she won't let you touch her because she's trained, you know, to work with me. And um, she, it was a beautiful Belgian Malinois, gorgeous dog. But he said, she, she won't let you touch her. You know, she might bite you. And so I, I can't. Um, so I said, well, what could we do? Um, I happened to have a stuffed animal with me because I had been teaching a class. So I said, could I show you some things and you could do it and you can mimic what I'm doing. And so he said, yeah, of course. So he got her out. We laid her blanket out. She laid there on the floor in the terminal and I massaged the stuffed animal and I, and he just copied everything that I did for her. And we were able to together give her a really good massage and she really enjoyed it. And I was really touched by that and, and by their relationship, the dedication that they had to one another. And also of course, their, their service. <laughs> I guess my dogs like that story. Somebody else <laughs> likes the story. Yes. <laughs> that is a wonderful story. A wonderful story. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so I'm curious about, you had mentioned essential oils in a story with, with the lemur. Could you tell us if it's, you know, how, how, how safe is it to use essential oils with your dog? <laughs> That is a great question because essential oils can be such a great tool to enhance a massage or even just enhance your, your care and management of your pet. But it does take some, some knowledge and training because not all essential oils are safe. Um, and even how we use essential oils is very different. You know, some oils can be ingested. Uh, some oils can be put on topically, but others need to either be diluted or produced in, in other ways. The safest way to use essential oils with pets is just allowing them to smell the essential oil. Um, but just know your dogs and your cats have a much, much better sense of smell than us, right? I, I forget exactly what the numbers are, but I think for every one um, um, nasal receptor for scent that a human has, a dog has over a million. So we don't need to use a lot of essential oils with pets. They can be overwhelming. As a matter of fact, what might smell great to you and me might be completely overwhelming for your pet. So um, there are, there's a lot of great books and videos out there that give you ideas of how to incorporate essential oils into your pet's life. Um, for cat owners, especially, they should be cautious because some essential oils are very hazardous for cats to ingest or even smell because of the way they metabolize fats. Oils are a fat, so um, they can be harmful to cats. Even if you're using essential oils yourself in your environment, and, and sometimes it can be the essential oils that we use in our cooking, you know, like um, oregano. Um, if you have cats in your home, you want to be cautious about their exposure to those things. Um, we have an a, a aromatic science program, and we have a woman that teaches it who is phenomenal. She uses essential oils with pets in many, many different ways. Um, so there are a lot of ways you can learn about essential oils, and that can be really helpful. Um, as a matter of fact, um, it's one of the things we use when we have geriatric pets who are maybe um, losing their sight or their hearing, but they have a good sense of smell. You could use essential oils to help map out pathways in the house that they follow so that they can find their food bowl or find their water or find the door to get out if they're having trouble seeing. Great idea. And, and um, are there any typical oils that tend to be commonly liked by, by dogs that you know of? Yeah, I use a lot of chamomile. Um, so there's Roman chamomile and there's German chamomile. They have different properties, but they can both be very useful in just calming. They're also great if you dilute them um, in, an, in like a jojoba oil, which is actually a wax or in, even in like witch hazel, um, they can be very calming for skin irritations. Um, frankincense is an extremely powerful oil. It's a precious oil um, and it can be inhaled and it can help with cancers um, and viruses. Uh, lavender, of course, is um, a lot of people's favorite essential oil. It's also a very good one in proper dilution for burns or skin irritations. It's antibacterial, antimicrobial, so it can be really helpful in guarding our, our pets against um, pathogens in their environment. Um, and um, as I mentioned before, uh, well, citrus oils can be really nice too for just uplifting the mood of, a, of an animal who might be depressed or lethargic. Maybe they've recently lost a friend 
um, or they're in a different environment and they're depressed, they're not eating. Citrus oils can, can really help to kind of uplift their mood and, and um, bring that energy back up. But we have to be careful with citrus oils because they also make an animal uh, photosensitive, which means if that animal goes out in the sunlight, they can um, get overexposed, they can get sunburned very easy. So that's an example of where an essential oil can be really beneficial, but it could also be potentially harmful if not used properly. Okay, so definitely people should get the proper guidance about mm -hmm. how to use before just going to the pharmacy <laughs> or the yeah, store right. and purchasing. Or the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. It's very easy, very, very easy to get access to essential oils. And it's really important to get pure essential, not synthetic ones for use with animals. Um, but then also to, to have some, some good information about uh, why you're choosing an oil and, and how to, how to um, deliver it to the animal. And are there different types of massage for uh, injured animals or animals with behavior issues? Indeed, um, there are many, many forms of massage. Most people are uh, probably familiar with Swedish massage, and that is a, a great system of massage for healthy animals. It's the basis of what we call our foundation level program, the first level of massage training that we offer. And so we use that for animals who are healthy, active, um, but just benefit from the support that um, Swedish massage provides for your circulation, your immune health, and your skin. But there's also uh, massage techniques that are more uh, specific to animals who work for a living or who are very active or athletic. Uh, things like trigger point therapy or um, um, myofascial release therapy, um, those, those are very powerful for performing dogs. Uh, and then we have a rehabilitation program where we teach people things uh, like manual ligament, or sorry, uh, manual lymphatic drainage, which is a technique to support immune system and um, movement of lymph. So older animals who get a lot of stagnation, maybe they're not mobile anymore, or animals who are perhaps paralyzed, maybe restricted to a, a wheel, wheelchair or wheel cart, um, they would really benefit from manual lymphatic drainage. So there's a wide range of uh, techniques. There's a lot of different courses that we offer um, and that other um, trainings offer uh, based on uh, the animal's needs. Do you, have you ever worked with an animal chiropractor? Oh yeah, all the time, all the time. So we align very closely with chiropractors, uh, acupuncturists, traditional Chinese medicine practitioners, holistic veterinarians, um, and, and general veterinarians as well. So um, massage is a really great integrative therapy. So most professional massage practitioners work very closely with uh, a client's veterinarian team as well. If there is a medical condition involved, we want to be talking with them about what we can do to help and how we can provide support. Uh, but we want to know what the medical team is doing as well. You know, for example, if an animal is on pain medication, well, massage can be a powerful pain management tool. So in many cases, using both routine massage and pain meds means we can maybe decrease the dosage necessary or even allow the animal to use um, a more uh, a lower dose or a more natural pain reliever most of the time. And then that way, if they are experiencing increased levels of pain, you you have somewhere to go with it, you know, but if you're only relying on pain, pain medication, at some point you top out, and then what do you do if the situation gets worse? So yes, we work a lot with uh, other practitioners, other paraprofessionals. And the, and the type of massage in comparison to human massage, I've noticed from the video, there wasn't, you don't use oils, you are, right, there isn't that kind of I guess there is no need, right? Because it's, you're working on fur or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are times when you might use something topical, but most of the time not, uh, for a couple of reasons. I mean, the, the skin of the animal is, um, has its own natural oils. And a lot of times when we're massaging, we're helping express those oils. So we're utilizing the animal's own system to provide some of that glide on the surface. Um, but also, probably one of the biggest differences between the massage that you and I might get and the massage that animals often respond best to is the amount of pressure. Um, because a lot of people like either firm pressure or deep pressure, but animals respond extremely well to lighter pressures or maybe firm pressure. But um, in my own human practice, 
I might use oils or things to help with being able to use more depth. Um, whereas in animals, I may not need that. Also, the animal's skin is not going to be as clean uh, in a lot of situations as uh, humans, and the oils might actually plug the skin or, or not be beneficial in that case. Um, but we do use you know, hot and cold applications, essential oils, as we mentioned in some cases. Some people like to incorporate music into their massage sessions. It, it really depends. But um, I find for the dogs and horses and any of the animals really, that movement is a big part of the sessions for them. They're what we call kinesthetic learners, meaning when they feel something happening in their body, they're gonna wanna explore that through movement. So having the ability for the animal to get up and move around at some point during the massage is often important in my sessions, which means, you know, if I'm going to get a massage, I wanna be like on the table, and I'll probably be asleep in a few minutes. <laughs> but with my uh, animal sessions, I'm often doing stretching and letting them move and asking them to do things to help support the work. Would you massage a dog always on a massage table or would you massage them on the ground? I mean, where do you, Yeah. what does it look like? Well, well I personally tend to work more on the ground with the dog. So I use uh, these large circular yoga mats that, that I found that um, are really nice because they give us enough room to do movement as well as just be able to relax. So often the dog after a few minutes does lay down, stretch out on a, a blanket, but um, there are times also when I do use a massage table and some therapists use a table the majority of the time. It's helpful with smaller dogs or um, sometimes dogs who are really busy. It limits the amount of space they might have to, um, to try to move away. Um, so each session's different. I also find I like to mix it up over the course of the day. If I'm working with horses, I'm definitely standing up most of the time. Um, so with the dogs, I might be down on the ground with them. I might be kneeling. I might be sitting. So sometimes it's nice to also put a dog on a table where then I can be standing or I can have just different um, access to the animal. Or I might be in a clinical setting where a table is going to be more kind of the, the environment that's offered. And where would one find a therapist for their pet? Mm great question because there is a it's just like hairstylists there's such a range of therapists out there you know and finding the one that just suits you can can really be um, a hunt in a haystack right um, one thing I recommend is that people really look into where their therapist um, was trained or at least what level of training they have and I would recommend you look for somebody with at least 300 hours of training or somebody who is nationally certified so there is an organization called the National Board of Certification for Animal Acupressure and Massage. And they have a website, um, it's nbcaam.org, and they have a directory of their nationally certified practitioners. I'm proud to say that our school has the largest number of nationally certified graduates in the country, but um, you will find graduates from many different programs and people with a wide range of specialties um, from across the country. Um, through that national organization. Uh, another possibility is you can visit our website. We list, we have a directory of all of our graduates uh, and they're you know, all, all through the US, Canada and all around the globe. So those are some, some ways to find a qualified practitioner. You could also ask your veterinarian. They might have somebody they refer that they like to work with. Or you can ask your fellow pet owners. They might have a therapist that they're working with. So uh, I think word of mouth is a really good way to, to find uh, therapists. Of course, you can do an internet search as well. Uh, most therapists have a web presence or they have you know, um, a website where you can schedule your appointments and find out more about them. Those are some thoughts. Sounds good to me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing all this incredible information. and. Um, Sure. This is, you want to tell everybody how to get in touch with you, if they have any questions. Yeah, we love to talk to people about animal massage. So if you have any questions about animal massage, please feel free to visit our website, uh, nwsam.com, Northwest School of Animal Massage is the name of our school. And uh, our office staff is 
ready to talk to you about the courses we offer. Uh, any questions you have, you can also visit our Facebook page and talk to students and graduates there. We have a great busy community. Uh, we also um, have our free introductory classes, so that's a great way to kind of get your feet wet. If you want to go to our website, you can link to those free classes. We have uh, introduction to animal massage, introduction to animal acupressure, and introduction to aromatherapy available. Uh, let's see. The other thing I would um, suggest is if you call our office and you mention that you heard about us on Dogs Up Care On Air, then we will offer 10% discount to anybody that enrolls in a class uh, as a result of hearing about us here today. So um, we'll look forward to talking to you more about you and your animals. That sounds great on that note. Thank you for your time and all this incredible information. And I just want to thank everybody for tuning in to Dog Care on Air. And we will see you soon. Thank you.